Hi and welcome. I'm Moira Dale and in my life I've had the privilege of living for a bit over two decades in the Middle East in a number of different countries, learning, working and learning lots from the women who are my colleagues, especially my neighbours, my friends. And over time I began to realise that in all the books and the study of Islam, the courses I'd taken, there was something missing. We were being shown one side of Islam and it was a real side, but it wasn't the whole picture. We were missing a whole dimension of what was happening. And so a couple of years ago when I was asked to give the Arthur Jeffries talk at the Melbourne School of Theology, I decided to ask the question, what would happen if we took a different perspective on Islam? What would it look like if we took a wider view? What new insights might we gain about Islam and about the women and men who were part of the Muslim community? So what you're going to hear is the audio from that talk. And I'd like you to come with me now in our journey as we ask that question. Let me invite you to walk with me tonight into the old city of Damascus. And we're going to go through the Eastern Gate, Bab Shari, which dates back to Roman times and takes us immediately into the street called Strait. It's still the main east-west arterial road through the city just as it was in the time of St Paul. Nowadays the route is more constricted and the remains of the Roman pillars, and you can see some there, that used to mark the wider traverse, are buried further back amid the foundations of the houses and the shops that mark the narrow road and crowd onto the pavement. Striking further north, we see the Umayyad Mosque ahead of us. It still dominates the city as it did when it was built in the time of the First Roman Empire, as it did when it was a magnificent cathedral dedicated to St John the Baptist, and before that an imposing temple to Jupiter stood on the same site. Men are removing their shoes as they step into the mosque courtyard. However, today we're not going to join them, instead we're going to spend a little while lingering in the nearby market. You can take your choice of the wares you want to buy, all kinds of materials, clothes from the mundane to the exotic, tent makers, carpet vendors, shops <coughs> of jewellery, fine china and glass, interspersed with public coffee shops, bathhouses and smaller mosques that are linked with particular artisan guilds. Today, let's pause in one of my favourite places in Ilmi Earth, and that's a spice market, <laughs> with sacks of different coloured spices herbal teas, jars of condiments, cinnamon sticks up to a metre long, pyramids of soap, hanging goods, and the strings of dried opera or chilli, all the substances that make up daily life and health and flavour. Going further then, we strike into the maze of narrow streets and alleyways that make up so much of the old city, described well by T.S. Eliot, streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Oh, do not ask what is it, let us go and make our visit. We wander through the streets, house balconies almost meeting overhead through archways, along lanes bounded by tall walls with small doors. So let's go and make our visit. Let's stop and enter one of those small doors. And if you're tall, you'll have to bow your head to enter. We go through a narrow corridor and we emerge in a courtyard open to the sky. In the centre is a fountain playing and the smell of jasmine or orange blossom delicately perfumes the air. The family house is built around the courtyard with rooms opening onto it. Women pass across this space and children play. And this is the home, the engine room, or more properly the beating heart of society. From this place, both men and women come and go, but with differences. And these differences can include how they access space. Pat Prayer comments on the Muslim system of Purda in the Indian subcontinent, describing how in this world of separated space, men have free and unlimited access to the public space while women are given limited access. Conversely, women are given free and unlimited access to domestic space while men have limited access. Wealthy families in many parts of the Arab world traditionally had big houses divided into the men's area and the women's area. In Turkish or Arabic, we call them the salamlik or the haramlik, 
or in Farsi, the Biruni, the public area, and the Anbruni, the private area. The public area of guest room, the Betak in Pashtun, is the area that male guests could come into, but without entry to the rest of the house. However, female guests can enter the private communal area with full access to all the women and children there. I remember a male colleague who'd moved with his, women and ch his wife and children um, into a traditional area of the Muslim city. And soon after their arrival, there was a knock at the door, the husband opened it, and there was a group of neighborhood woman, women at the door. They went straight past him and into the kitchen and family area to meet his wife. <laughs> even living in a modern apartment building in Damascus, where the other apartments were all inhabited by an extended family of brothers. We women would regularly visit each other across the different apartments. When one of the men entered the door into the communal stairwell, wanting to go to his own family apartment, he'd clap his hands or call out before he could ascend to give us women time to go to our own spaces. So if he could metaphorically walk around House of Islam, Dar al Islam, we can picture it with different areas opening onto the different parts of a house. There's a men's room, which is a more public area where male guests can come and go. And this can open up into public space, other public space, including the mosque and the market. And then there are the windows into the women's space, the private or more domestic part. Permitted men can enter the women's part. And women can also go into the public areas, but each face restrictions in the other space. As we look at the House of Islam, friends, through what windows have we been focusing our gaze? And how can we gain a comprehensive view? Camilla Klingerova and Thomas Havlicek, writing on the status of women in, men, in world religions, note that religious studies tends to be rather androcentric, male-centered discipline. And their comment rings true in the field of Islamic studies, both by Islamic and Western writers. While there are increasingly female authors writing, <coughs> overwhelmingly the books and articles published on Islam are still by male authors. And men writing on religion generally tend to focus on official religious texts, formal religious rituals, public space. And this is one viewpoint, a window through which to look into the house of Islam. And it's an important viewpoint one that needs to be included and not dismissed, but there are other windows offering different perspectives that also need to be considered in order to see the whole house. Women's frame of reference looks also at patterns of daily life, family space, rites of passage. Physically, where I'm standing shapes my view. I can see some things, but others are obscured. Those of you who are sitting in another place in the room or even people in another part of this building, you'll see things that I can't see. In the same way now that we know that as researchers, where we stand inevitably guides what we see and don't see. The questions we ask and don't ask, how we look, even what we look for. Yet surprisingly, there's been little discussion of how this shapes the way Islam is understood or taught. It's surprising because the whole recognition of the importance of perspective in research is not new. It's nearly 30 years since Patty Lather noted that ways of knowing are inherently culture-bound and perspectival from a given perspective. Feminist, feminist studies have helped unpack how rational knowledge by making claims of neutrality and universality effectively hides the fact, the reality of how the research and the knowledge it offers is shaped by the experience and background of the researcher. There's a consequence that often female experience is made invisible or distorted. We can see this pattern of restricted access in other fields beyond religion. In anthropology, male anthropologists have access to and write about the men's world. However, Leila Abu Lubad suggests that in gendered societies like the Arab world, the flow of information between men and women's worlds is asymmetrical. The hierarchy of power means that men will talk to each other in front of women, but not the reverse. And low and young and low status men will tell female relatives the news of men, but a conspiracy of silence excluded men from the women's world. For example, Steve Caton, researching in Yemen, was confined almost exclusively in the world of men in this sex-segregated society. His access to the domestic world of home and intimate gatherings of close friends and relatives was limited. 
this gendered asymmetry finds architectural expression in the traditional lattice or mushrabiya windows in the harem walls, which allowed women to look out and see who came and went. They had a view on the comings and goings of the men's world, but it was impossible for those outside, those in the men's world, to look inside into the women's world. So too Earl Sullivan, writing on his book on women in Egyptian public life, suggested that when men view the roles of women in society, they often see little more than the reverse of their own self-image. Women, however, often see a more objective picture of themselves and men. So then, this is in no way a critique of those who study the world of men. We believe it's an essential area of study. <laughs> <laughs> the only critique is when that's taken to be the only area or even the normative perspective. So how do we approach a field of study? I suggest that there are two ways. One is to assume a normative subject in the field that's the object of our study and then it follows that everything else is either deviant or abnormal. Amina Wadud in her groundbreaking book, Quran and Women, describes the underlying presumption that the male person is a normative human being for Muslim scholars. Are women the same as men or are they different from and distinct? Are they alike and unequal to or unlike and equal to? Each of these questions rests on a single rhetorical flaw that women must be measured against men that inadvertently reinforces the notion that men are the standard bearers, which by extension means that only men are fully human. <laughs> what are some of the implications for Muslim women? In her book, Muslim of Theology, Selina Yatlivio writes of how in Islamic legal discourse, the menstruating and the postpartum, post-birth female is proscribed from participation in ritual prayer, reading the Quran, fasting, and going around the Kaaba in Mecca. Celine comments that the periodic preclusion of the female from such key ritual performances defines her pietistic capacity in her difference from the normative male who experiences no such reoccurring mandated interruption of devotion routines. In this way, the perception of female irregularity contributes to a hierarchy of a, of a social hierarchy of genders. Now this normative approach has been around for a long time across a whole lot of fields, not just Islamic scholars. Generally, when we say human, we mean men. For example, in medical studies, the male body has been primarily studied and used to establish norms, so the female body is then treated as abnormal. It's only recently that researchers have recognised that the female body has its own norms, but they're different to the male ones. How many people have a Fitbit here? Anyone? No, not so many. I'm intrigued. <laughs> I just need to warn you that the calorie or step count on Fitbits underestimates steps during housework by as much as 74% of the calories burned in housework are 34%. <laughs> Reach, researchers have found sex differences in every organ in the human body and how it functions, as well as the symptoms and severity of all common human diseases. And this has big implications for understanding how diseases present, how to diagnose and treat them. A couple of months ago, the ABC reported the findings of a team in Sydney Uni describing the symptoms of heart attack for women. And guess what? It doesn't involve the shooting pains in the arm or the side that's taken as normative. It's normative for men. Women will probably experience nausea, dizziness, shortness of breath. So is misdiagnosis the reason that women die from a heart attack far more than men do? Similar examples occur across almost every field of human activity and research. What about missiology? What are the implications for how we train people, our plans of outreach, how we use resources, and even more fundamentally, how we understand the communities with which we're seeking to engage? Kenneth Craig wrote about Islam with profound and poetic insight. And in his Call of the Menorah, he describes how for Muslims, everyone's prayer mat is a portal mosque, and wherever they choose to spread it, they can find their qibla, their direction, and worship God. But friends, Craig was writing here only about Muslim men. Women cannot turn public places into prayer sites as men can. 
I've met women in sheltered places, even in old and ruined mosques, putting their handbag in front as a sutra, a mark or a barrier, and prostrating on the bare and dusty floor, but they cannot pray in public spaces with the same freedom as men. Requirements of modesty, cleanliness and purity constrain their freedom to turn outside space into places of worship. Their play, primary place of prayer is the home. So if we follow Craig and similar writers uncritically, not realising that it's everyone, only covers half of the Muslim world, however, are we to realistically think, pray, dream about how the whole Muslim community can come to know Jesus? So what is the other way of engaging with the field of study? Rather than basing it on a defined or more often assumed single standard <coughs> or point of reference, we can take an approach that assumes diversity and difference as normative. And about diversity can include gender, geography and ethnicity. Peter Riddell has done a whole lot of work in foregrounding Quran commentaries from Southeast Asia in the face of a tendency to privilege Middle Eastern and African um, Arabic writers and commentaries. And Bernie Power has richly described how the nature of a God who is Trinity allows celebration of diversity in every aspect of how we practice our faith, including dress, direction of prayer, and language. Let me suggest that taking difference and diversity as normative with Jesus' approach. There's been quite a bit of attention given to the male-female prayers in the Gospel of Luke. Less attention, I think, in how they occur in Acts and the other Gospels. For example, the male-female pairing of John 3 and 4, which is so strong between Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman. Mm -hmm. And in the Epistles, this male-female pairing is so strong that Ben Witherington suggests it has to go back to Jesus' teaching and example. So what are the implications for us if this is true? Perhaps it means that every sermon should include specifically male and female examples, applications. As we read, write and teach, we should expect reference lists and bibliographies to include material by both women and men. Our lectures, our learning, our teaching and writing should be based, like Jesus, on the explicit recognition of diversity with a consequence development and application of material bringing in different perspectives rather than assuming a single, neutral, normative stance. Back again at the Dark House of Islam, Dar al-Islam, and our diversion into wider fields of study helps us recognise why, for the most part, we've been looking through one window into Islamic studies in the male part of the house. And what would happen now if we look through some different windows into the, another part of the house, into women's space, We'll of course cover some of the same subject matter, um, history, sacred texts, but from a different perspective. Other matters of faith and culture and community that aren't covered in most courses and formal texts of Islam include rites of passage, family, hospitality, purity, shame and honour, and there are issues that deeply shape life for both men and women in Islam. We don't want to substitute women as the norm instead of men, but rather ask how, it, how including women's vantage point can help us review our whole understanding of Islam for both women and men. Through including women's perspectives, we gain a more comprehensive view of the whole house of Islam and the people who live with, within it, women and men, and how the gospel might encounter them. What are some of the areas we might find in women's windows. What insights might they offer? Theological and missiological, as we return to read the Bible in the light of the questions that we encounter with our Muslim friends. I suggest tonight we might look at rites of passage, family, purity, and prayer. So let's take a brief look at them in the time that we have. In Egypt, as I visit the house of a new baby, the room is full of women, with men also joining in on the edge of all the activity. In the centre, the child, just a week old, is carefully wrapped and laid in a large decorated sieve. The women ululate loudly, and one of them bangs a brass porter and mess, mortar and pestle noisily, so the baby will grow up brave, even in the face of threatening sounds. And the new mother carefully steps seven times across the incense burner as the smoke wafts through the room, protection from the evil eye. 
The grandmother takes a sieve, shaking it horizontally, telling the baby to be obedient to the family, and then the baby is carried round the house, with one of the women scattering salt or rice as they process round the area for protection or prosperity. Afterwards, the extended family and guests sit together, enjoying candy and nuts together with the Mughat drink that is given to help the new mother in breastfeeding and serve to all the guests who attend. This is the Egyptian seven-day celebration after a baby is birthed to name the baby, keep away the evil eye, and make sure the child grows up brave and obedient. Friends, we've given lots of attention to the official rites and practices of Islam. The liturgical prayer five times daily, the Friday sermon, the fasting month of Ramadan, pilgrimage to Mecca. In anthropological terms, these are rites of intensification. Rites that are based on the weekly or the yearly calendar which serve to intensify or reinforce community values. And most rites of intensification take place in official or public religious space and are led by men. The other kind of social ritual is the rites of passage, rituals which mark transition from one stage of life to another based around lifetimes rather than calendar times. Birth, marriage, death are all times of significant transition. Arnold van Gennep, who first described these rites, described the society as similar to a house that's divided into rooms and corridors. And Mary Douglas adds that passage from one room to another is dangerous. There's risk moving from childhood to puberty to adulthood, and most societies have well-developed rituals around protecting the dangerous <coughs> time of pregnancy and new birth. Most rites of passage tend to happen in domestic space and are presided over by women. It's women in societies around the world responsible to enable family members to move safely from one life stage to another and maintain health and harmony within the family. So what are some of the roles that women play in rites of passage? At birth, women are in attendance when even men may not be present. My neighbour called me one day to go with her to visit another neighbour's niece who'd gone into labour, and the father was still waiting nervously outside in the street when we arrived. We went inside to where the young woman was sitting on the floor where she'd just given birth, the midwife was cleaning up. This was women's space, even for those not closely connected. In West Java, women leave the communal think about ceremony in a woman's pregnancy to thank God that the woman and the fetus have made it safely to the seventh month and ask for their protection and blessing over birth. And in the Sabur, the ancient Sabur ceremony that I described, celebrated throughout Egypt, seven days after the birth of a child, it's women who direct the different parts of the ritual to seek life and health for the, long, for the mother and the child. At male circumcision, it can be women who are the ones celebrating with dancing, music and sweets while men are the ones who usually sign the official marriage certificate in the mosque. It's women in the family who are usually the ones involved in negotiating and deciding which girl is an appropriate bride for their son or nephew or brother. Women would knock on my door to ask if I had a daughter or sometimes friend <laughs> who was available for marriage. I won't tell Miriam connection. <laughs> and the mother of the bride may visit the newly married couple to ensure that consummation has taken place. Women are often the ones accountable for children succeeding in school. At times of sickness, women take responsibility to care for family members. At death, women wash the dead bodies of women. Sarah Mullen suggests we could say that religious power and authority resides both with the Muslim imams and with the women. While the power and authority of the Muslim imam is community-based and exercised through established authority in the mosque, Women will engage in rituals and what she calls superstitious practices quietly within the family context. Friends, attention to rites of passage also helps us reread the Bible, in particular the Gospels, which are built not just around feasts like Passover, but rites of passage, weddings, funerals. Luke's Gospel, for example, starts in official religious space, the temple, the centre of religious life, time of community prayer, and the official religious representative Zachariah responds to the angel's message with this belief. <laughs> but then the gospel narrative moves swiftly to rites of passage to women's space, conception and pregnancy, birth, circumcision and naming for John and then for Jesus, and ends with death, 
women going to anoint the corpse with spices and so becoming the first witnesses of the resurrection. Returning to look at rites of passage in Islam, we want to ask more about the part played by both men and women, in particular, recognising how Jesus used rites of passage to tell about the coming of the kingdom of God, we ask how we can use these times, birth, coming of age, weddings, funerals, to share the hope of eternal life for both men and women with our Muslim friends. I knocked on my Muslim neighbour's door one day and she opened it. Dressed as she so often was in the all-covering prayer skirt and top, they are always convenient to hand by the door so we could be properly covered if any man knocked at the door. And as we sat and drank sweet Arabic coffee together and talked over the affairs of the day and the building, her two-year-old pulled out a prayer mat and tried to put on the skirt and top himself, imitating what he saw his mother do so <laughs> often. The home domestic family space is where religious identity is formed from the earliest years of childhood. If in the West, one of the strongest relational bonds is between the husband and wife, in many Muslim countries, the strongest social relational bond is that between mother and son. Children learn their faith in their earliest years from their mother's example and teaching on the home. Under Islamic law, we know that children take on the religion of their father, but what really happens in daily life? <coughs> Even in an informal survey in Indonesia of mixed marriages suggests that two-thirds or more of the children took up their mother's religion into adult life. This gradient of authority is summed up in the, traditional, in the tradition which tells how Aisha, the young wife of Muhammad, said, who has authority over a woman? And Muhammad told her, her husband. So she asked again, who has authority over the man? And Muhammad said, his mother. <laughs> right to the Muslim world. Women have an imp, and I can tell you how the fate of Syria hung on that relationship at one point. Women have an important role, especially in, in maintaining religious identity. At times of pressure or persecution, mother will whisper secrets of group identity to daughter, reinforcing cultural traditions and values through life cycle rituals. Women may continue proscribed religious practices in the home, away from state supervision. Under 70 years of Soviet rule, in Tajik Muslim women continued practices of prayer and fasting, and in women's group rituals in village communities, a woman learned in religious matters would lead others in prayer or problem-solving ceremonies. Family is an all-important institution in Muslim societies. Sayyid Qutub, on whose teaching the Muslim Brotherhood is built, commented that the, the family system, the re relationship between the sexes, determine the whole character of a society and whether it is backward or civilised, jahili, ignorant or Islamic. Sayyid Maududi, who founded the corresponding Jamada Islami in the Indian subcontinent, writes in his book on the status of women in Islam that the so-called moral concepts which the Western world introduced a century or adopted a century or a half ago have already resulted in the disruption of family life and produced licentiousness and sexual anarchy to an extent hitherto unknown in history. An Islamic website agrees and suggests an answer. The family, the basic unit of civilization, is now disintegrating. The Islam's family system brings the rights of the husband, wife, children and relatives into a fine equilibrium. It nourishes unselfish behaviour, generosity and love in the framework of a well-organised family system, offering peace and security in a stable family unit. It's seen as essential with the spiritual growth of its members. A harmonious social order is created by the existence of extended family and by treasuring children. Friends, as we look around us at what's happening in society today, we can stand with our Muslim brothers and sisters against more secularising social trends in affirming the value and sanctity of family as created by God. But it's not just a social value. The family is a picture of what we're called to become through what Jesus has done, becoming part of God's family, God's own children in relationship to our Heavenly Father. We hope to see afresh how radical this new relationship is, beyond that of being created beings in relation to a creator, or even obedient slaves or servants. The Muslim emphasis on family means we can take it up as a rich, redemptive analogy 
from wisdom to what God calls us to in Christ. Christine Maluhi reflects on how the focus on families that she encountered in Muslim communities has helped her to understand more deeply both the fall and also Jesus' saving work for us. Describing how family morality works, she comments that this reflects the same understanding of sin that Adam displays in the story of the fall. He hid from God because he was ashamed and he was subsequently put out of the home. In Arab society, the consequences of sin are shaming your father and family and being put out of the home. The only way you can get back into the house is when an intermediary comes and takes you home to reconcile you with your father. And the gospel story speaks directly to these societies and the good news is that Christ took our blame and our shame and he's the intermediary who brings us back into our father's house. To be a Muslim is to be part of the Ummah, the international community of Muslims everywhere and the terms linked with the Arabic word for mother. The New Testament calls us to remind one another that we're part of God's worldwide family of believers. This means that as people give allegiance to Jesus Messiah, they're becoming part of a much greater family of mutual belonging right around the world. For us Christians, as members of Jesus' family, we're committed to care for and be, and be strengthened by one another, even beyond our family or ethnic loyalties. And this metaphor of how we live out our redemption in Jesus also means that we cannot exist independently as individuals or as individual churches, but are all to depend on one another so that the family, the body of Jesus Messiah may be complete with all its members and equipped for all God calls us to. What is purity? I was visiting a Muslim friend in hospital and as we talked, I came on to com commented on the Quran on her bedside table and asked if she was reading it. Oh, I can't, she told me, I've got my monthly period. And you, do you read the Bible when you're menstruating and impure? If you'd been in my place, you have said. <laughs> Richard Hibbert describes standing outside the meeting place for a church of people of Muslim background when a young unmarried man arrived late and came up to him and after greeting Richard he whispered in his ear that he just had sexual intercourse but he hadn't washed. Could he go into the meeting? He didn't think so and Richard realised that in the young man's mind the problem wasn't the illicit sex itself but the fact that he hadn't ritually washed to remove the uncleanness before approaching God. If you'd been Richard, I wonder what you'd have said. The subject of purity wasn't part of the standard teaching of books and courses that I took on Islam, yet it's a topic with which all the books on fiqh, Islamic jurisprudence, begin. It's a part of the daily preoccupation of Muslim women and men. At every moment, they're either in a state of purity, tahara, or impurity, najasa. Ritual pollution or impurity prevents people from being able to perform ritual prayer, to fast, to touch the Quran, or to circumambulate the sacred Kaaba, the black stone in Mecca. While purity affects everyone, women are more impacted. Down the bottom is some major sources of impurity which require full body washing, not just the wudu, the washing of face and hands and feet. All the categories that cause major impurity apply to women, only half affect men. I encountered the subject of ritual purity as a frequent part of Muslim women's discussions in daily gatherings, sandwiched among recipes and household concerns, with all of its impact on their daily life and religious practices. Because to be a Muslim is to be impure for at least a week of every month, basically a quarter of her life from say 15 or so at puberty, through to menopause, maybe 50 or 60. If she's married and having sexual intercourse, if she's caring for children, changing nappies, cleaning up after them, then she may be impure for most of the time, unable to participate in ritual prayer, fasting, or reading the Quran. Marjorie Butelard comments that this, although this only means that women are more often impure, but certainly not inherently more impure than men, in practice, women tend to be more strongly associated with impurity than men. A believer, a young woman of Shiite background, describes how I used to struggle a lot. I was always in doubt. Am I clean to talk to God or not? As a woman in Islam, I was always najis, impure. The famous tradition about women lacking intelligence and piety links with their inability to fulfill their religious requirements due to impurity. 
Muhammad tells a group of women that they're deficient in intelligence and religion. And when they say, why? He says, isn't the evidence of two women equal to the witness of one man? So, deficient in intelligence. Isn't it true that a woman can neither pray nor fast while she's menstruating? Deficient in religion, in piety. Now, it's easy for us, I think, to dismiss his concern for purity as legalism, unrelated to our daily life and faith. Yet we find that the Bible is also deeply concerned with purity, both moral and ritual. Much of the Torah, especially Leviticus, lays out detailed rules of ritual purity as part of participating in God's community. Friends, the Old Testament taught us the importance of sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins in order to approach God. And we know that in Jesus, sacrifice is not abrogated, but it's fulfilled. After Jesus' willing sacrifice of himself for all, there is no other sacrifice that can ever compare or be needed. So too, in the Jesus community, ritual purity has not been abrogated. We do need pure hearts and bodies to be able to pray, to encounter God's word. But as we are baptised, which means ritually washed through the cleansing blood of Jesus, we are so completely purified that there is no other ritual washing can ever be effective or needed in order to pray or read God's word. The three gospel stories of the Gerasene demoniac, the bleeding woman, and Jairus' daughter, which are clustered in Luke 8 and Mark 5, are all about issues of impurity. Here we see a man possessed by unclean spirits living among tombs full of dead bodies, a bleeding woman and a dead girl, and each one of those, any one of those, would mean that someone coming in contact with them is defiled, requiring ritual purification. But what happened to Jesus? He's not defiled. Instead, the spirits are cast out into pigs or so unclean, and the woman is called, the dead body is called back to life, and the woman with bleeding is healed. In the Old Testament, as in Islam and in many other religions, defilement is contagious. You touch something that's defiling, you become defiled. However, in Jesus, we see the opposite. In Jesus, purity becomes contagious, casting out uncleanness. As he touches people, purity is restored to them. These three stories tell us that in Jesus, we can be purified from all defilement, from whatever we have done, or whatever others have done to us that defiles us, Jesus wholly purifies us. And this is good news. Mm -hmm. Let's come to prayer. <coughs> Upstairs in the women's section of Middle Eastern Mosque, it's a time of secret prayer. Women are sitting in silent concentration. It's quiet. Just the sound of lips moving and someone's periodic murmur. A few of the women are rocking their bodies as they, little as they sit. Some are passing prayer beads through their fingers. The outside noises of cars and voices come in from the road, but inside the women are quiet and still, concentrating. The girl beside me is weeping softly as she continues to pass the prayer beads through her fingers. A low voice begins to recite something, and others join in quietly for a little while, and then there's silence again, with only the muted sound of voices whispering to themselves, lips moving. A woman in the front row begins to sing quietly a song of worship. I knew you, Lord, in my heart and in my thoughts. She sings this a few times in some other phrases. And other women sit quietly, some moving their lips, rocking their bodies slightly. In learning about Islam, we learn about the five daily times of prayer that punctuate the Muslim hours, expanding and contracting through the years with the daylight hours, just like the old monastic prayer times. We learn about the use of liturgy in Islam, use of the body to give form to their worship. And sometimes we learn about requirements of purity, which so restrict Muslim women's capacity to pray the form of salat prayers. However, there's so much more to Muslim prayer beyond form of salat prayer. There's zikr and du'a prayer, both less constrained by requirements of purity and they both evoke deep emotional expression in prayer. The Zika prayer uses rhyme, rhythm, and alliteration, whether through repeating popular prayer invocations or songs and choruses, to focus the attention of the praying Muslim on God. Zika is traditionally associated with Sufism. 
However, it's more widely practiced by people who don't claim any Sufi affiliation. In particular, Sikha prayer has found its way into the growing Muslim piety movement, spreading among Muslim women and men around the world, together with other elements of Sufi orders, including the emphasis on teaching, on the practical application of teaching to piety in everyday life and participating in a wider religious group. Zik is a form of corporate prayer. Maybe we could like it to ecstatic Pentecostal singing, group singing. And then there's also doa or supplication, which is a deep river of devotion flowing through the everyday life of Muslim men and women. At the end of the time of Zikr at the mosque, there's a slight shifting of position of women moving for, leaning forward, hands together, palms up. One woman leans in the door out. There are about five minutes of petition from Muslims throughout the world for our sisters in Iraq, in Palestine, asking God to heal us, our land, our society. Don't cut us off from your service. God purify us from our sins and trespasses. And the women join with Ms. Amin, 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 after each petition. The leader finishes by saying the Fatiha, which is the first chapter of the Quran and the Muslim and the women murmur it quietly with her, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Rabbil Alameen ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Yarnu Abbit, and so on. And at the end, a number of them wipe their faces with their hands. Dua finds its way into every part of life, not as bounded by purity in language as Salah, liturgical prayer, not as controversial as Sikr, with its Sufi associations. Dua includes invocations for a ward in the next life, but it's perhaps even more important for seeking power and protection for the needs of this life. And so it has a really important place in the lives and practices of Muslim women who must find a way to access divine power to fulfill their responsibilities for family welfare and harmony amid the restrictions of bodily purity so weighted against women. Written, recited, or spontaneously uttered, Dua voices the piety and deep desire of women and men across the Muslim world. I've seen women and also men gathering at shrines from Syria to Sumatra, murmuring prayers from the booklet that are usually there in a small pile for the visitor seeking extra efficacy or baraka, blessing from the holy person buried there. Dua's supplications are usually related to particular situations rather than for specific needs. So there's invocations prescribed for a whole range of daily situations, such as entering and leaving the bathroom, putting on new clothes or undressing, when it thunders, when the new moon is sighted, when you're traveling, when you hear a dog bark, when a child dies, when you see the first new dates of the season. A common supplication is the Auz Billah, I take refuge in God from whatever lurking dangers are encountered. And this finds Quranic authority in the number of Quranic chapters. When you recite the Quran, seek refuge with God from Satan the accursed. Auz billah mi shaitan rajim. And it occurs frequently in the books of recommended dua, taking refuge as part of formal salah, as well as the exclamation of the ordinary person in the street is out of fright. Hmm. And dua can also go beyond formal phrases and set repetitions to express the innermost hopes of the petitioner, whether in Arabic or in other language, or the most inarticulate expressions of hard longing. And in this, Dua recognizes the possibility of a God who is present to and may intervene in every part of our lives as we seek him. We're told that God is distant from Muslims, yet Muslim women right around the world speak of God in relational terms. Experiencing a sense of God's closeness of peace and calm when they pray, I've seen women weeping freely in both Sikha and Dua. So how can we build on their longing for relational closeness and emotional expression in pointing to God who comes to us in Jesus? When we talk about prayer, just using the one word in English can sometimes mean that we don't get further than talking about Salah, liturgical prayer in Islam, and we miss the different words that indicate different kinds of prayer for Muslims. The Bible uses a whole range of prayer, different words for prayer, expressing all kinds of prayer, formal and informal, different ways of speaking or singing or crying out, different body postures, both corporate and informal. As we learn more about prayer in Islam, 
It takes us to more deeply to seek to understand the riches of biblical expression and patterns of prayer and ask how what we see in the Bible can be taken up into our own lives, not only individually, but also communally. And we ask how the Bible can help us engage with the different expressions and longings in the hearts of Muslim women and men. Friends, where have we been to? What are the implications as we leave here? Well, we've walked into the heart of a Muslim city and into the homes there. And in the homes, we found different windows offering different perspectives on Islam and the lives of Muslim women and men. Becoming aware of these different perspectives, we asked how we approached different fields of study and focusing on a particular normative subject, what perspectives and insights might we miss out. As we looked at the House of Islam, looking into the windows in women's space, we found a number of areas to explore. These included rites of passage, family, purity and prayer, and as we began to look, we found that even a short visit to these topics could offer new insights, not just about Muslim women, but also men, and about rereading the Bible to engage with Muslim men and women. And there are other topics we haven't had time to explore tonight, including shame and honour, hospitality, blessing or barakah, the evil eye, patronage. Might I suggest three implications for us tonight? Can we ask ourselves, what windows have we been looking through? And what other windows and perspectives do we need to engage with in our study, our learning, our teaching, our engagement with people? Can we ask ourselves, how can we follow Jesus' example and make diversity rather than a single norm the basis of our assumptions of what we learn and say, of what we write or teach and of how we relate to others? And can we ask ourselves, who are my Muslim friends? Who am I sharing life so deeply with that every part of my life and theirs becomes a bridge for the gospel, a chance for them to encounter Messiah? Friend, if we each one had a close Muslim friend, what would we have learned? And more importantly, what would they have seen of Jesus when we all meet back here in a year's time, the next lecture? As followers of Jesus, all our study should lead us to worship God more. The questions that I've encountered through my meetings and conversations with Muslim women have helped me to see Jesus more clearly and the rich dimensions of what he has done for us. And these questions have taken me back to the Bible to read it again, and as I've done so, to love more dearly the Jesus of whom the Bible teaches. And through these encounters and questions, I seek ways to invite my Muslim friends, women and men, to join me in following that same Jesus more nearly, day by day. Thank you. <laughs>